Well, what I wanted to do very briefly is to kind of discuss the field of incretin therapy. I do think that this is a very exciting area when you look at the pathophysiology. Now, of course, the big barrier is going to be cost. We've been talking about agents today that are, you know, generic, much lower cost. This remains the chief barrier here, particularly when you look at GLP-1 receptor agonists. Prohibitively expensive for large majorities of our patients. This is my own poor attempt uh, at making a, a cartoon just to say, what does native GLP-1 do with the intake of carbohydrates? It's released in the distal ileum and uh, uh, proximal uh, large bowel, and it has several effects that I think all uniquely benefit glucose homeostasis. It increases insulin, but so do other drugs. We know that type 2 diabetes is a state of hyperglucagonemia with inappropriately non-suppressed glucagon levels. And the GLP-1 receptor agonists and the native hormones suppress this hyperglucagonemia. We know the first thing you lose in developing type 2 diabetes is that loss of first phase insulin secretion. And that the insulin peak is actually much later in individuals with type 2 diabetes than non-diabetic individuals. So perhaps slowing gastric emptying will help that second phase response catch up a little bit. And probably most prominently, we know diabetes is driven by this obesity epidemic. And anything we can do in terms of uh, suppressing satiety or increasing satiety and suppressing appetite, perhaps leading to weight loss, could be very beneficial in these patients. So what are the key features? And again, I don't have time in this talk to really go over a lot of the studies. But what are the key features of incretin therapy? Well, hey, one of them is their glucose-dependent nature. They only work in a state of hyperglycemia. If you're abnormally low in terms of glucose, they're not going to further stimulate insulin secretion. So they auto-regulate. Their effectiveness diminishes as you head into the hypoglycemic range. So they're glucose-dependent. That means they don't lead to hypoglycemia in many cases. Weight loss. Uh, so a lot of the therapies we've traditionally had have all led to progressive weight gain, and it's gotten to be a common uh, sort of acknowledgement that with improving glycemic control, inevitably weight gain is going to occur. Now, we hope that's not the case, and with proper nutritionally counseling, we could perhaps avoid it. But the incretin based therapies are certainly weight neutral, or in many cases, hold out the promise of potential weight loss. I think some possible but unproven uh, benefits are uh, at least using incretin therapy in a lot of the studies that are utilizing continuous glucose monitoring, we're seeing a benefit in reducing glycemic variability. And that's still a raging debate in the field. How much is it overall glycemic exposure, as nicely reflected by the A1C, and how much is this minute-to-minute, -minute, day day-by-day glycemic variability contributing to the long-term complications? I'm not going to have an answer for you today, but at least I think in the future going forward, well, one of the interesting things about incretin therapies is they do reduce that glycemic variability. What about beta cell preservation? Animal models, rodent models really suggest a decrease in beta cell apoptosis and an improvement in beta cell mass, but we've not yet seen that in human studies. Perhaps that's because it doesn't exist, or perhaps is that the current way incretins are used as an add-on therapy in many patients once they've failed once or two agents, and again, at diagnosis, you're down to 50% of your beta cell function. You're losing percents every year. So by the time incretins are typically started, you may be down to 80% less beta cell function. Perhaps that's too little too late. And what I'm dying to see sometime in the future is an earlier interventional trial, perhaps in pre-diabetes with incretin therapies, uh, something on par with the diabetes prevention program. What about direct cardiovascular benefits? We know there are GLP-1 receptors in the cardiac cells. We know they're in the vascular endothelium, but we, and there's some early suggestive studies, but we really need to see some long-term outcome studies in terms of uh, benefit and uh, direct cardiovascular benefit. So what are the key features of incretin therapy? Well, in general, GLP-1 receptor agonists are slightly more potent than DPP-4 inhibitors. And I'll just touch very briefly on some of those trials in a minute. What are the advantages of the DPP-4 inhibitors? Well, they're really, the number one advantage is ease of use. They're oral, and they're relatively less expensive than the GP, GLP-1 receptor agonists. What are the advantages then of the GPL, GLP-1 receptor agonists? Well, they are more potent, and there is at least a possibility in weight loss in a percentage of patients treated with these agents. Um, and they do have slightly increased efficacy compared to the DPP-4 inhibitors. When you're looking at the GLP-1 receptor agonists, I think what we're going to be seeing is that the longer-acting GLP-1 receptor agonists are somewhat more potent than the shorter-acting because they also affect the fasting plasma glucose. They give back a little in terms of postprandial 
uh, control, but they make up, more than make up for that in terms of reducing fasting plasma glucose. And so the overall effect on A1C lowering is a little more uh, potent.